Thank you, Peter, for that plug. I really do greatly appreciate that. Um, I have to admit that I also was the kid that got stuck in the locker, and I got the question wrong today. So I've got a whole lot more, more work to do. It's an honor to be here tonight uh, to describe for you the incredible work that our team of scientists and researchers are doing here at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Um, this is going to be a story. And the story and the first slide that's going to follow may be a little disturbing to some, so you may want to cover your eyes. But like any good story for me, it does start here at the University of Michigan. <laughs> and so as a graduate, that E.F. Hutton minute was not really 15 seconds. It was a bit shorter, so thank you for that. Um, as an undergrad of the University of Michigan, I certainly formed football loyalties, but I would have to say that I'm a Buckeye. I've been here for 17 years and certainly love this institution. So. We're going to take the helmet off and talk about Alfred Worthen, who's a pathologist at the University of Michigan. And this is him in the early 1900s. And Dr. Worthen is a pretty stylish guy. You can see him here dressed in his nice wardrobe. And he spent a lot of time at his seamstress, getting his pants hemmed, getting his tailored suits. And he realized that whenever he talked to his seamstress, she seemed very sad. And she was always forlorn. And he finally said to her, what makes you so sad? I don't understand this. And she then went on to describe that she knew what her fate was going to be that she would end up like the picture that her brother's holding of family members who have been deceased from cancer at an early age. And so she reported that her family members ended up dying at the ages of 40 and 50 from a variety of cancers, including colon cancer, as well as uterine cancer, which for this purpose I'm going to be calling endometrial cancer. And so it was grandparents and parents and siblings, her siblings, that end up dying of cancer. And Dr. Wortham pretty quickly recognized that there may be some association between the family history, and this association with cancer. And it was this individual here that circled, Henry Lynch, that really began the process of understanding the genetic basis of malignancy. And so this is Dr. Lynch when he was honored at our professional society a few years ago. This is one of my favorite photographs because this is the selfie with Dr. Lynch. That's me up in the corner. <laughs> um, just barely in there. But Dr. Lynch described the syndrome that we now know as Lynch syndrome, which is this hereditary predisposition to developing malignancies of the colon and the uterus and the small intestine and the ovaries. And so I came here to Ohio State actually because of this gentleman, but not just because of him, but because of the expertise that was here at Ohio State. We have some of the world-class scientists that understand the basis of DNA and understand how it relates to this development of Lynch syndrome. And so as we go through this today, we realize that endometrial cancer is a pretty big issue. As you can see, it's actually 7% of all cancers in women. It's the fourth most can common cancer in women. And it's about a lifetime risk of about 2.7%. And so it means that about a woman has a baseline risk of 3% or so of developing this cancer in her lifetime. But what's remarkable is that if she inherited this predisposition to cancer because of Lynch syndrome, that she actually has up to a 60% chance of developing colorectal cancer or endometrial cancer in her lifetime. That's a pretty shocking statistic. And so as a clinician, I see patients like Sally here on the left every single day who comes in with a diagnosis of endometrial cancer. And she certainly is worried about the treatment that she's going to receive, how's it going to affect her life, and what's her prognosis going to be. But I think she's equally concerned about what the impact is going to be on her daughter in the middle or her granddaughter to her left. And so in this circumstance, she knows that because her mother had endometrial cancer as well, that there may be this pre disposition because of Lynch syndrome. And it's because of patients like Sally that we undertook this really ambitious research enterprise, this, this experiment called OPTEC, the Ohio Prevention and Treatment of Endometrial Cancer. Seed money was provided by Pelotonia to get this up and off the ground. And so this ambitious project has three parts to it. Part one is improving the ability to detect Lynch syndrome in women who have endometrial cancer. Part two of the project is our prevention aim. The best kind of cancer to have is one that you never get. I think we can all agree with that. And so in this purpose, what we're trying to figure out is how do we communicate to patients and their family members that they may have risk of developing cancer, and how do we keep them from ever getting that disease? And the third aim is that of treatment. What can we do to improve the outcomes of the women who are diagnosed with endometrial cancer? And so let's talk about these individually. This is DNA. You guys all knew about that. So DNA is our genetic code, like Dr. Moeller said. And so we've got an amazing opportunity to understand the basis of the genetics of cancer because of what's called the Human Genome Project. We've actually sequenced the DNA of a variety of different cancers. And so now, because of this, we're able to undertake in this OPTEC project 
the ability to do next generation sequencing, really high end sequencing in a collaboration between the Comprehensive Cancer Center at Ohio State with Nationwide Children's Hospital, where there are world class experts in genomic medicine. And so what we're gonna be able to do is to test Sally's DNA to determine whether or not she might have Lynch syndrome. We can unlock her DNA and also look at other susceptibilities to cancer. In the second aim, this is our prevention aim. Once we know that Sally has Lynch syndrome, it's really important to her because number one, she may be at risk for other types of cancer that she's not gotten yet. And so that's gonna be important to get her into the appropriate strategies to prevent her from getting those cancers, whether it's colonoscopy for risk for colon cancer or other types of cancer as well. But equally important is the fact that her daughter has a 50-50 chance of inheriting that genetic code that may predispose her to develop Lynch syndrome herself. And so how is that communicated? We've actually convened focus groups within Columbus already of individuals who have Lynch syndrome. And we've engaged our university's Department of Communications to actually figure out what the best means is to communicate this genetic information to family members. It might be easy between the mother and her daughter, but what about Sally's second cousin out in Florida that she's never met before? You know, that's not an easy conversation to have to say, I've never met you, but because of our genetics, you may actually have a risk for developing cancer. So this has never been done before, and this is really remarkable that we have this opportunity to really experiment and figure out what the best means for communication is to assess this risk. The third aim of our project is that of personalized medicine. So personalized medicine, as I'm sure everybody knows, is the process of getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. You know, we're not all these blue shapes. There's the orange shape, and we want to know who is that orange shape that can best benefit from treatment. And so here's where learning about Sally's DNA is critical. So because of her Lynch syndrome, we know that she's going to be incredibly susceptible to this new class of drugs that are called immunotherapy. This class of drugs are quite remarkable. And so a little bit of science here, but if you think about cancer in your bodies as being foreign, we should be able to recognize that cancer is foreign and just like a virus, attack the virus and kill it such that we should never be suffering from cancer. But cancer has this unique ability to put a shield around itself such that it actually evades the body's native immune system. And so these immunotherapy drugs actually take off that shell, take off the shield and allow the body's own immune system to attack and kill the cancer. And so for those who heard the story about Jimmy Carter having melanoma that metastasized to his brain, he was treated with immunotherapy and was cured, essentially. That's something that never happened 10 years ago. This is a new class of drugs. And so understanding Sally's DNA through this process, communicating with other family members to prevent them from getting cancer, and then treating her with these appropriate class of medications is what we can all do to improve her outcome. And so as the leaders of the Optech project here in Columbus, we have an incredible opportunity to expand this across the state. All of these dots represent a specific hospital in the state that treats women who have endometrial cancer. And in fact, these 15 locations treat probably about 80% of all the endometrial cancers across the state. So we have this rich network of collaborators, collaborators across the state who are gonna actually enroll their patients and work across the same aim. Again, with the leadership here at Ohio State trying to improve these outcomes. And so it's with our expert team of researchers, our geneticists, our genetic counselors, and our clinicians who really do believe that through the appropriate means by detection, prevention, and improving treatment, that we're going to get one step closer to our ultimate goal of creating a cancer-free world. Thank you very much.